Madam President, I rise today to oppose the nomination of Kristen Clark to be the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division. As I've said multiple times, I, I'm not here to call into question Ms. Clark's motives, uh, nor am I here to call into question whether she's a good person. In fact, I'm willing to assume and even concede for purposes of our conversation today that she is a good person and that her motives are good. It's not my job as a member of the Senate uh, uh, to go beyond that, but I do have some very serious concerns reflected in Ms. Clark's record. Concerns that, regrettably, uh, she has failed to rebut. First, given the importance of the Civil Rights Division to the enforcement of our nation's anti-discrimination laws, I'm concerned about past instances in which she's publicly pushed the Department of Justice to not pursue egregious instances of voter intimidation. Ms. Clark criticized the Department of Justice's decision to prosecute Ike Brown for voter intimidation and suppression. As a reminder, in that case, the case involving Ike Brown, a Mississippi Democratic official engaged in rampant vote manipulation and absentee ballot fraud. Rather than praising the Justice Department's successful prosecution of the case, she criticized the decision, stating that some of the claims were quote unquote weak. When asked point blank whether she agreed with DOJ's decision to prosecute two members of the new Black Panther Party, who, by the way, showed up to a polling place wielding a billy club, she demurred, saying, quote, I believe the leadership of the Justice Department had the prerogative to bring the cases that it deemed appropriate to bring, close quote. Well, that's a completely non-responsive answer. It's a little like saying Congress has the prerogative to pass the legislation that it deems appropriate to pass. In short, Ms. Clark was unwilling to decry outrageous voter suppression and intimidation when Democrats were implicated. Now, she's shown, shown no corresponding hesitancy in challenging common sense election security laws, like voter identification requirements passed by Republican state legislatures. Indeed, she's frequently challenged state election laws, attempting to paint ballot security measures as categorically racially discriminatory, which raises the question, does Ms. Clark, in fact, oppose all voter intimidation or just voter intimidation against certain groups when the position the nominee is applying for involves being the head of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, the, the, the very division that's responsible for overseeing voting rights laws. That's not a question that you want to have to ask. Second, Ms. Clark has shown a troubling disregard towards certain constitutional rights. A few years ago, she decried the Trump administration's creation of a religious liberty task force, saying that the goal was, quote, to make it easier for people to use religion to mask their discriminatory goals. Shameful, close quote. Now, I would remind Ms. Clark that the very first sentence of the Bill of Rights safeguards the very religious freedoms that she accuses of masking discriminatory goals. Again, late last year, Ms. Clark attacked the Supreme Court's decision in Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo, claiming that the court's ruling wrongly privileged, quote, religious freedom above all else, close quote. Now, by way of reference here, just to set the context straight, that's, that decision, in, in the Supreme Court's ruling in Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo simply stated the common sense proposition, one that's, in my view, unremarkable, that, that, that government must treat mosques and synagogues and churches the same way that it treats liquor stores and acupuncture clinics. Statements like these give religious Americans, like myself, pause. Why should we believe that she'll defend the civil rights, including the religious rights of all Americans, not just those with whom she happens to agree? 
Finally, I'm worried about Ms. Clark's failure adequately to address her troubling history of inflammatory statements and irresponsible activism. In college, she wrote an article stating that, quote, melanin endows blacks with greater mental, physical, and spiritual abilities, something which cannot be measured based on Eurocentric standards, close quote. Not surprisingly, she was asked about this at the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. And when she was asked about it at her hearing, she claimed that this statement was meant to be satirical. But at no point, not during the hearing, not in connection with follow-up questions for the record, did Ms. Clark ever acknowledge the obvious, that the statements were unacceptable, regardless of whether she intended them to be satirical. Likewise, rather than express regret for her decision to participate and assist in, in, a, in a conference defending cop killers and domestic terrorists in law school, she merely said that she provided logistical support. That contradicts the statements made by numerous speakers at the conference who personally thanked her for her efforts. In preparation for that same conference, Ms. Clark recommended that an article entitled, quote, Mumia, Lynch Law, and Imperialism be included in the conference newspaper and discussed as one of, uh, at, at in, in connection with one of the panels. That article contains some of the most inflammatory anti-police rhetoric I've ever seen. Here's a quote from it, an actual quote. The Klan is now the police with blue uniforms replacing the sheets and hoods. The corrupt racist judges are petty Klan administrators, close quote. When asked about her promotion of this article in her questions for the record before the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Clark stated that she had no independent recollection of that email. Now, once again, we have here a complete non-answer. Ms. Clark declined to explain, much less take responsibility for, associating herself with extraordinarily, obscenely dangerous rhetoric. Moreover, if Ms. Clark were to be confirmed, she'd be responsible for overseeing pattern and practice investigations of law enforcement agencies, which makes her unexplained, inexcusable involvement with anti-law enforcement activities all the more troubling. I'd also point out that the article's author, Amiri Baraka, was, like Professor Martin mentioned a moment ago, famously anti-Semitic. On one occasion, he wrote in reference to Jews that he had, quote, the extermination blues, close quote. So again, we have Ms. Clark casually associating herself with a virulently anti-Semitic thinker. Ms. Clark also decried, uh, Ms. Clark also denied on the record that she had served on the editorial staff of a college journal with Amiri Baraka. But a simple Google search of Kristen Clark and Amiri Baraka shows that when she was an assistant editor of that journal, Amiri Baraka was a contributing editor. Her denial of this easily verifiable fact is hard to understand. Now, let's, let's be perfectly clear. I, I, I don't bring any of this uh, up to suggest that all of it is, is unforgivable. I, look, every, everyone has, from time to time, said or done things that, uh, that they later come to regret. But let's keep in mind what we're looking at here. Ms. Ms. Clark herself is asking us to apply a very different standard to her than we've applied to others. A different standard in many ways than she has asked be applied to others. In 2019, her name appeared on a letter sent by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, where she sat on the board of directors of that organization, opposing the nomination of a lawyer named Brian Bounds, who had been nominated to serve on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. That letter stated that, quote, while Bounds recently apologized for those comments, comments that had come up in connection uh, uh, with his confirmation proceedings, 
The timing of that apology suggests it is one of convenience rather than remorse, offered in a last-ditch effort to salvage his nomination." Close quote. In her hearing testimony, Ms. Clark provided no explanation for why we should overlook her extraordinarily controversial activities and statements while she was a student. Rather, she attempted to minimize or, in some cases, even evade her actions. Ms. Clark's history of irresponsible actions and words didn't end with law school. In 2019, she signed a letter defending Tamika Mallory, a woman who stated that, quote, white Jews uphold white supremacy, close quote, and had associated herself with Louis Farrakhan. When pressed on this point, she gave no explanation for her statement of support, other than saying that the letter denounced anti-Semitism. Now, I'm confused. How can a letter defending a woman accused of making anti-Semitic statements actually be a letter that is denouncing anti-Semitism? Either anti-Semitism is bad or it's not. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And the way I read that letter, I, I, I don't see the letter as saying, yes, that statement was bad, but there are other circumstances that should be considered. Instead, I see a, a wholehearted defense of the individual herself. Likewise, just last year, Ms. Clark wrote an article titled, I Prosecute Police Killings, Defund the Police, But Be Strategic. When pressed about this by my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Clark once again sought to evade responsibilities, saying that she has, quote, developed a practice of being deferential to editors on title selection, close quote. I don't think that's how this works. The article does, in fact, have her name on it. And even if she was deferential, the fact that she's describing herself as deferential here, suggests that she did, in fact, make a conscious decision to defer. She didn't say, I had absolutely no choice in it. I didn't see the title. She just said that she had adopted a practice of being deferential. In any event, you can hardly blame the editor for the title that he or she chose. Ms. Clark wrote three times in that piece, three times, quote, we must invest less in police, close quote. In short, Ms. Clark's record reflects a consistent pattern of inflammatory statements and actions, followed by a disclaimer of responsibility and a lack of candor and remorse. Moreover, her record gives us reason to doubt that she'll defend the civil rights of all Americans, not just her political allies. For these reasons, I regretfully cannot support her nomination. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.